Okay, let's see. All right, Marty, can you tell my buddy Tico to shoot his shots afterwards? Because I know he's got to make his 100. And he wants, by the way, he wants to make 180 shots today. He wants to break Dylan's record. My son is at the office right now, the older one. And they're watching The Last Dance every day, pretty much. Uh, they got two more episodes left, and they make 104 shots every day. One reads 40 pages, one reads 20 pages. And then they watch a documentary of my choosing, and he's trying to make his shots right now. Anyways, good morning to everybody. I see a bunch of you guys getting on. You were in the waiting room. We got a 1,000 people. The chats are going nuts. Oh, my gosh. Let me just tell you guys I've been looking forward to this. I got a bunch of things to share with you. Um, I got some excerpts from the book. You'll be the first to uh, read about it. And uh, I'm happy to say, because of all of you, I mean, I got to tell you, Valley Timmy, you're something else. Because of all of you right now, the, the book is ranked number one for new sales in entrepreneurship. And uh, uh, I have a feeling this is going to be a book when it gets in your hands. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be looking at business and everything you do in a complete different way. I'm getting people from India, people from Israel, people from Australia, all over the world, Orlando, Florida, Argentina, Brazil. Uh, uh, do we have any people from the Middle East, Dubai? New York, Spain, Qatar, Greece. I love it. We got a bunch of people on. And if some of your friends were trying to get on, remind them to get on because uh, we're about to get started. So having said that, Mario, do you want to set us up on the PowerPoint? Yeah, you just go to, let's go here. What would you like me to do here? Let's share screen. It's on the Zoom. Here? You go to the Zoom. Zoom. Let's uh, share the screen. Share the screen. We yeah, got it. Go here. here. Yep. All right, let me bring this up. Let's uh, go to slideshow. Slideshow, be beginning. Sorry. So now let me ask you, do they see me right now or no? Uh, yeah. Guys, are you able to see me at the same time? Because it says Kai here. Are you able to see me and see this? Okay, all right, let's get right into it. So a few things before we, uh, 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 before we get into it. Here's what to expect from uh, today's uh, Zoom. Number one, I promise you a chapter, I have it here. You'll be the first to get a chapter. And by the way, the chapter that was chosen, there, there are some things in there that is gonna talk about, uh, there's some controversy in there that I'm talking about why I made certain decisions in the past and uh, me getting sued back in 2009 from a $400 billion company and a letter I wrote uh, 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 Jerry Maguire type of a letter. There's a lot of stuff in here uh, and some stuff I'm talking about with Elon Musk and Xerox. So the chapter you're getting is probably one of the top five best chapters in the book, top four best chapters in the book that I'm sharing with you. So hang tight to find out how to get this copy here. And then uh, uh, 20 of you will get the first 20 signed sleeve of the book, Your Next Five Moves. You'll be able to do whatever you wanna do with this, frame it, and I'll even make it personal to your name once you see how you can get that part. And then I'm gonna choose a few parts of the book to read to you, a few parts of the book to read to you. You get to choose and tell me, Pat, read this chapter or read that chapter, I'll read it to you. And then at the end, I'll announce how uh, some of you guys can win a contest to come here to Dallas and uh, spend half a day with me. We'll do a video together, a Q&A session together in the conference room, and you'll be asking questions, and I'll be writing stuff down on the board, and that'll go down on the Valuetainment channel. So many of you guys will be on the Valuetainment channel uh, based on some of the things that we'll be doing with that as well. So having said that, let's get right into it. Uh, the story behind your next five moves. So, you know, it took me four and a half, five years to write this book. I've gathered so much content of wanting to write this book. The reason why I chose to write this book is, is because every time I see somebody, if I go to a restaurant, if I go into a business, if I go into anything I look at, if I watch a basketball game, if I watch the campaigns, political campaigns, I think about if I'm running this campaign, if I'm the campaign manager for Barack Obama or Trump, how would I be doing it? If I'm looking at how this person failed in their campaign, but they have a good message, why did they fail? If I go to a restaurant and I see the experience of a restaurant and I tell myself, why are they doing it this way? If I was running this restaurant, what would you be doing? If I'm sitting with somebody who has a great product 
and they're not scaling the product and it's very limited. Why are they doing this? What would you be doing? But pretty much everything comes down to your next five moves. So if you look at it right now, because of a, without even having done this uh, uh, webinar yet, the book is right, right now ranked number one in new release entrepreneurship. If you look at it right, in, right there in the middle, number one new release in entrepreneurship. And uh, some tells me when you guys get uh, uh, ordering and really we drive this and get the audience and the team to do what they're doing with this book, I think this thing's gonna be number one uh, uh, in entrepreneurship period, not just new releases. And then we'll be competing uh, to see where we'll rank on all of Amazon top 10, top five, and possibly fighting for first place which will be uh, an amazing thing to do as a group. So a few things you need to know about your next five moves. So why does this matter today? Here's why it matters today. By the way, just to manage expectations with everybody. So this isn't just a book. You obviously know I'm not a consultant just writing a book saying, here's what theories I have for you. Here's what's going on with my life and the businesses I'm running today, okay? Number one, on the media side, Valuetainment has grown more in the last four to eight weeks than ever in the history of, history of attainment. We just crossed 2 million subs. We're already at 2.33 million subs. And we'll get to 10 million subs in no time. And I've been heavily recruiting for talent on Valuetainment right now because of where we're going next. You're going to hear about what Valuetainment is going to be long-term as a media company competing with some of the other media companies. And we have some major plans that you don't know about that uh, maybe we'll talk about with some of you guys that come over here to see the big vision of what really is taking place but it's not just five moves. There's 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 moves in place with the proper sequencing of what we have to be doing next. So media company growing aggressively. On the insurance side that I run, uh, our biggest month ever in policy count is 6,600 policies. This is pre-pandemic. This month, we're on track to write over 10,000 insurance policies just in a month of May with all the madness going on with all the lockdowns, with shutting it down, with everything going on, it's our biggest month. Last month was our biggest month in revenue and top line and commissions and policies. And this month's gonna be our biggest ever in revenue, top line, commissions, policies, everything. So what I'm sharing with you is not one of the, uh, 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 you know, thousand books that I've read that if you see that bookshelf, oh, I'm just writing a book because of some ideas that I got from other books I read. I'm sharing stuff with you that I apply in business myself, that's gonna apply to yourself and what you are right now, whatever phase you're at. So if you think about this, here's what you'll notice, a few different things. Number one, what are your next five moves aftermath of COVID-19? Meaning, coronavirus, if you haven't already made your right five moves, you're already behind the eight ball, but I'm talking post-coronavirus. So watch this, just an example for a lot of you to be thinking about. Zoom yesterday, valuation came out for Zoom yesterday. Zoom is worth more than the other seven top airlines combined. Let me say this one more time. The value of Zoom, which is what we're using right now, is now worth more than the top seven airlines combined. Let me say it again. American Airlines, Delta, United, Southwest. You combine top seven Zoom is worth more. Zoom is worth $48.4 uh, $4 billion. All those seven airlines combined to get our $46 billion. So why is that? Okay, what do you do with this? What are airlines going to be doing afterwards? Is airline industry an industry to even be in moving forward? Would you yourself want to be in the airline industry? Do you think this pandemic is the last time that something like this happens? Are you prepared to see that how much power media has to influence governments and states to shut down and what if another pandemic like this happens? Is your business prepared for it? What are you gonna be doing yourself financially? How important is it for you to have your millions today, not to have the millions because of the Ferraris and the Lambos and the Porsches and the Rolls Royces and the houses and the gated communities? The importance of having millions of dollars today is more critical than ever before because nobody can control you and push you around. So what are your next five moves post-coronavirus? Graduating taking place right now. I've been sending videos to different graduating class saying, Pat, can you send us a video? And I'm sending videos with people. And the, the question is, what are you gonna be doing? So maybe you just graduated from college and you're watching this. What are your next five moves? You were thinking about going into one industry, maybe it was hotel management. Maybe hotel management may not be the best industry to be a part of. Maybe you were thinking about going into another industry that you were so excited about. Maybe you gotta start thinking about it. Am I making the right decision to go into that industry? 
maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not going to go into the event business. Maybe I'm going to be making adjustments because people are going to be afraid of how much people are going to be in the same place. Is that the right direction to go to or not? So your pivots, your, your pivots are going to be very important today. Reopening of the economy. Some of the people that are on here, I got a lot of weird messages yesterday from a handful of uh, uh, major Hollywood celebrities that sent me messages yesterday on Instagram saying, you have no idea how much we follow your content. But a lot of politicians uh, are now value tainers and they get on here and they ask about campaigns. I've had a lot of conversations with different politicians that are campaigning right now, what to do. So now how do you reopen the economy? How do you differentiate your state against the other states? How do you make sure you're not losing a bunch of people from your state right now? I tell you one thing right now for a fact, people that are living in California, never ever have we gotten this many people, whether they're politically on one side or the other, who are thinking about a move. And the states they're looking at are Tennessee, Florida, Texas, Georgia, even Nevada. There's these states that are getting people. Why? What is going on for people to be looking at other states? So if you're running, if you're yourself or a congressman, senator, mayor, councilman, whatever it may be, what are some of your moves yourself in your lo local cities or states that you're running? What are your plans when you reopen the economy? Thoughts on relocating. These are five moves. Everybody's got to be thinking about what their plans are going to be five, 10 years from now, where you want to live for 10 years. You may be at a, at a place right now where it's warm and fuzzy. Look, I lived in Iran for 10 years and my parents sat there and they saw a lot of relatives were comfortable, warm, fuzzy because it's where they're raised, it's their family, it's everything. My mom and dad made a decision to go to Germany without speaking a language. We went to Germany, wasn't comfortable. We got our green cards, we came to the US. None of us spoke English. I didn't know how to pronounce the word government or Island, Gilligan's Island or Wednesday. It was very uncomfortable being here embarrassed but what they made the move of what country they wanted to raise their kids in. Many of you maybe are in the country because your family wants to be there. But what's next for you? I lived in California. And from California, I moved my entire family to Texas. Why? We did a lot of research. We made a decision why we wanted to move to Texas and we sold it to people. Are you thinking about your next five moves with what state you want to build your life and your business around? Relationships and turmoil. What do I mean by this? Marriages. Lots of funny things going on right now with relationships. Marriages. Parenting mom, dad, brother, sister, siblings, friendships. These are very weird times. You're seeing a lot of people talking about divorce right now. You're, saying, you're hearing a lot of people fighting with each other, bickering with each other. You're around each other. You're, you're talking about stuff that maybe you didn't talk about before. And I don't know if I want to be with you. And these types of conversations are taking place. And sometimes we're going to make the emotional decision that we're going to look back five, 10 years from now saying, I don't know if I made the right decision. That's part of your next five moves. Struggling financially. You're seeing a lot of stories with people messaging and saying, I need money. What am I gonna be doing? I'm counting on the stimulus. I need the stimulus. Your finances today, how long you can last with the kind of savings that you have in place today. Thinking about the credit cards, thinking about what you're gonna be doing to increase your finances, your next move so you're never worried about financially. Scaling way too fast today. There's some companies that are scaling way too fast. How do you make sure that doesn't hurt you and backfire on you? Needing to hire ASAP, losing a business, a lot of people message me talking about they've lost their business and they're concerned about it. What do you do? There are people that are contacting me saying, Pat, I'm a little scared. Why are you scared? Because I'm growing fast right now. I'm a little nervous. It's kind of weird because some industries due to the pandemic are crushing it right now. What do I do, Pat? Should I be worried? I don't want to tell my family that I'm making a lot of money right now because everybody's calling me asking for money. How do you handle when you're making money and everybody from your family is asking you questions? Do you give them the money? I feel guilty. They're making me feel guilty. They're saying, you're making money. I'm not making money. What do I do? All of those things that you're thinking about are part of your next five moves. If you have a strategy in place on what to do with your next five moves, this is all strategy right here. All of everything we're talking about here is about strategy, all of it. Hiring a new executive, which is what I just did. I just hired a major executive that's a multi six-figure year salary, multi, multi six-figure year salary. I not only hired one, I hired two, and the reason why we did that is because this is an opportunity to scale and take it to a whole different level. So do you go and hire people at a time like this? So now, all of these issues, Mario and I, we could have come up with 50 different lists to put up here. I'm just giving you some that are coming up to us. Every one of these issues, every victory, every loss, everything you do in life boils down to your next five moves. Make the wrong ones, you lose. Make the right ones, you win. You saw that little uh, 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 video that was made, that vignette that was made, with that being the audio, why, why am I saying every victory, every loss, everything you do in life boils down to your next five moves? Because it does. Everything does. 
you, you, you marry the right person, good for you. You got an edge. You marry the wrong person, you can have a setback of three, five, 10 years. You hire the right business partner, you're gonna excel. You team up with the wrong business partner, you're screwed. You know, you go out there and focus on one wrong client that you wink, wink, do business with them and no one's gonna know about, things go sour, they turn on you, that one client puts you out of business. Everything's about five moves, everything. You make a lot of money, you don't handle your finances properly, you spend too much of it, you didn't have the money in place for taxes, IRS comes after you, you're set back for five to 10 years. Everything has to do with your next moves. So now, can you type you, in, yeah, I just gonna change one thing here. Hang tight one second, Mario. You so just type in uh, TV for me. Instead of but Tikrin? Then, yeah. Okay, hang on one second. Everybody at this point knows you. Tikrin. Everybody knows who Tikrin is at this point. Okay, so now, the five moves that I apply in every aspect of my life, everything I do, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, my five moves that I go through first happen with the four, five areas you got to master. Number one is you got to master knowing yourself. Why is this? Because if you don't know yourself, you will make the mistake of wanting to live somebody else's life. And it's not a good decision. By the way, if you don't know yourself, many times you'll end up living your parents' lives just because you want to be loyal to your parents. And your parents didn't live a good life, but you want to be loyal to them. So you live the same exact life as them, thinking you're doing the right noble thing. And that's a form of not knowing yourself and who you want to be. I have three kids. The last thing I want them to do is to grow up to just want to be like me. I want to find out what they want to do. I talk to them individually about what they want to do, not what their daddy wants them to do. But we spend a lot of time on number one. And believe it or not, with all the people I've mentored in my life, number one is the foundation that most people haven't spent any time in. And we spent multiple chapters just on number one. Number two is mastering the ability to reason. Whenever I'm hiring somebody and I'm talking to them, you know what kind of questions I ask? Random questions. I'll say things like, let me ask you a question. If you were the president today, what would you do? It's a hiring question. Yeah, I mean, if you were the president of the United States today, what would you do? Well, that's a little bit uncomfortable because what if I said, I said, listen, don't worry about it. What would you be doing today? What do you think about what's going on with it? What do you think about the shutdown? What would you do differently if you're running a state? Well, um, I think I would first do this. And then sometimes I'll sit down and say, dang. And what if this happens though, if you do that? Well, this is why we do this. Hmm. I walk away saying, babe, this guy knows how to reason. I really like this way, the guy, the way the guy reasons. Yesterday, I'm interviewing a guy who ran a, it was a CEO of a former $200 billion company. And I'm looking at him potentially as being one of our CEOs, one of the, the CEO of one of our companies. And him and I are talking. Now, this guy ran a $150 to $200 billion company. You know what the company is. This is our seventh call he's had. So it's getting very serious. He's a very well-known guy in the insurance industry, and we're talking. You know, half the conversation that he and I are both having what it's about, how I reason and how he reasons. So he asked a question yesterday. He said, so let me ask you a question. What's one of your biggest concern about hiring somebody like me? And we went through it. I said, well, I'll just be very frank with you. Sometimes uh, industry CEOs, folks like yourself with a resume are way too snobby and you don't know how to talk to the average client. You don't know how to talk to the average agent. You don't know how to talk to an office of people that are insurance agents trying to run their own company. You're way too snobby. And he says, that's a fair statement. You are right. That's kind of, and he says, well, what if I this? How about if the, so we were having a, a two people just reasoning nonstop together because I've not met one person that becomes a CEO of a company or a leader of a major company that doesn't know how to reason. I have a formula in the book where I share with you, it's probably the juiciest chapter of the entire book where I go through how I reason. Matter of fact, there is a section where we have a worksheet for you to print out that we use on how we process issues. And that worksheet right here explains to you, the three by three worksheet explains to you exactly how I process the issue of being sued by a $400 billion company. And I open it up. Every move I made at 30 years old, I explain to you, here's why I did this. And you're able to listen to my reasoning of how decisions are being made. Then I share with you the system on how to reason because long time ago, a guy asked me and he said, hey, Patrick, you have kids. What do you think is the number one thing for your kids to learn to become successful? Is it knowing God? Is it hard work? Is it saving money? Is it respecting? Is it marrying the right person? 
Is it being healthy? What is it? It took me, I made the video when I made the video was uh, five years ago at a Glendale when my office was still in Glendale, California, five, six years ago. So I was what, 35 years old. 35 years old is the first time I said, I believe the number one skill set a person could have for making all of those decisions. Marriage is about knowing how to reason and process issues. Investing into an industry you know nothing about is about knowing how to reason and process issues, right? Befriending somebody and deciding to bring them into your circle is a form of knowing how to process issues and being able to reason. The number one skill set, my opinion, the number one skill set for somebody who continuously makes the right decisions is somebody's ability to know how to reason. And that's move number two. Number three is about putting the right team together. Once you know yourself, your vision, your future truth, who you want to be, once you have a formula on how to reason, then it's about going out and recruiting. And when I say recruiting, guys, I recruit all the time. I recruit investors. I recruit talent on valuetainment. I recruit sales leaders for my insurance company. I recruit executives for the insurance company. I recruit board members. We just brought on board a board member who was a former CEO, uh, uh, president of uh, Hartford. And he is now one of our board members. He was a former CEO and chairman of Limra, which Limra is like the board of realty for the insurance industry. He was the chairman and CEO for 15 years. He now sits on our board. He interviewed the CEO I was telling you about I talked to yesterday for an hour and a half. He's on my board. I recruited him. It took me a year and a half to convince him to sit on our board. Why? Because everything's about building the right team. Anything you do in your life, anything, marriage, parenting, selling, business, raising money, uh, media, business, investments, real estate, anything you do is about the team, the right legal team, the right accounting team, the right accounting firm, everything, the right publicist, the right, everything to you is about putting the right team together. So, so far we know mastering yourself, your future truth, then it's your ability to reason. Number three is being able to put the right team together. Then number four is the right formulas to scale. You could be a person who knows what you want to do. You could have the ability to reason. You could have the right team and you can still screw up if you're not able to scale it properly because when it comes down to scale, and maybe I'll share a couple chapters or excerpts from the uh, book today on uh, scaling. If you don't know how to scale and you don't have the right formulas for scaling and somebody else has the right formula and they have the top three as well, you can't compete with them. Again, say you know how to master knowing yourself, your vision, and another person does. You're good at reasoning. He's good at reasoning. You're good at uh, building a team and attracting people. He is as well. You're decent at scaling because you know some of the formulas. He knows the right formulas and how to drive him better than you. There, you can't, you're not in the same league. Two, two complete different leagues. It's not even funny how unfair this guy of an advantage this guy has over this guy. It's not even fair. So we spend a lot of time talking about scaling. And the last one that I put together is mastering power plays. And the reason why I put power plays at the end is because I grew up as a very nice guy. Um, I looked at everybody from a good, I grew up in a church and, you know, Christian family. And I was always kicked out of Bible study because I always questioned the realness of God. Does he really exist? For 25 years, I was an atheist, but I was a, I was an innocent kid in Iran. Very innocent. My parents sheltered me. I never played outside in the park ever in Iran, ever, because my dad was worried about kids being kidnapped. Never, not one time did I play outside in the streets by myself without my parents being there. Never. My dad would take me to the park every Friday when my sister was called Park Shahan Shahi. We'd go to the park, we would play together, and then we'd come home, right? I've never played outside. So I'm an innocent kid, sheltered. I think everybody's nice. Then I go to Germany. I live at a refugee camp. Then a kid who's, uh, I'm from Iran, he's from Afghanistan. A kid who's like a few years older than me, he starts befriending me. And next thing I know, he took money from me and I never got it back. And next thing you know, a couple things happens. He stabbed me one time on the side of my stomach. I'm like, wow, that was pretty, well. I thought we were friends. Then I said, wow, there's, <laughs> not everybody's nice. This is kind of shitty what just happened right now. And then I got a little bit, and I'm like, well, you got to kind of study some of these people, right? And then, and then you have a girl that you like, and the guy's also your friends, but he's only befriending you to get with the girl. I'm 11 years old. I don't know these games. I'm just kind of, you know, an ele innocent 11-year-old kid. Then I come to U.S. I go to school. I start learning about the dirty sides of bullying and all that other stuff. Then I go into military. Now, at the point of going into military, now it's the other way around. 
Now I'm the guy that I, I dare you to try to cross me because I'm not pissed off at the world. I'm like, say something. Let's start. To, so I'm the one that's getting into fights in the laundry room and uh, in, the, in the showers and fists being thrown. And people are, you know, Pat got into, but David got into another fight. And then it was like, okay. Then it was like a, a guard to not let anybody in. Then we created a crew that we're to till today we're friends with. My crew till today, we're all friends with from the Army 101st Airborne Division. We understand each other, right? We put a crew together. Then I go into business. Then I start selling. Then I start making money. Then I notice all these guys at the top were like, oh my gosh, Patrick, you're so amazing. I'm like, wow, people are really nice. What was sweet people? They're willing to help. Then I notice I started beating them. Then I notice they're no longer giving me advice like they did. Then I notice, you know how you go to a restaurant and you sit at a table that they would always sit with you? Then I notice you sit. They don't want to sit at your table anymore. They come, they see you, and they act like they didn't see you. They do one of these things, and then they go to the other table. What happened? You always sat next to me. Oh, because I'm beating you now, it kind of changed the dynamics, and you don't like that. Huh, who cares? We're just competing. No problem. Then I start an insurance company. Then we start the company, and we're growing. Then I get word that one of my competitors uh, uh, leaked some information to SEC and Department of Insurance, and he's just kind of creating fake stories and defamation of character. And a couple of the insurance companies dropped my contract, and they didn't tell me why. But later on, a couple of the employees that work for the insurance companies called me after they quit or got fired, and they told me the story. Then I said, okay. So to compete at the highest level, there is some dirty games going on. No problem. Let's play ball. That's why you got to learn power plays. Because the bigger of a level you want to play, you better believe not everybody's happy about your success. And if you're going to be the naive person playing around thinking, oh my gosh, everybody wants to me, wants to see me be a millionaire, be successful. You're a fool and you're naive. And I'm going to give you my part of how for you to process this. Then whatever you do with it, it's on you. So one of the most exciting parts of the book is going to be the power play side. Some tells me you're going to be reading that multiple times and referencing it over and over and over again. That section itself is, let me see how many, sec, how many pages that section is. That section itself is about 80 pages on the power plays. You're going to like going through that part. So again, once you know yourself, you have a formula on how to reason that's transferable to other people, you know, to teach. Then you go recruit the right people. Then you have the formulas to scale and you start kind of becoming bulletproof. Well, you give people the benefit of the doubt, but you're not naive and you understand some of the power plays. Now you're going to play ball. And once you have this formula in place, let me tell you, it's like a kid in a candy store. Like if you love competition and you love a game of Monopoly, or if you love playing Gin Rami or Spades or what, if you love a game where there is some sort of a competition, I, I promise you, you're gonna love playing the game of entrepreneurship, intrapreneurship, when you know this formula, these five things, and it'll help you go to another level. So now let me share a couple of sides of the book here. Matter of fact, I'll let you guys choose uh, I'll let you guys choose which one you want to read first. Okay, so we got people from Morocco. We got people from all over the place. All right, so I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, uh, page 78 to 80. I'll let you know what I have here. I'm going to read three of them. You tell me which three you want me to read, and we'll go from there. So the first one I got is what happened when I wrote a letter, a Jerry Maguire type of letter to an insurance company, and how this lady, which I don't give a real name because the lawyers at Simon & Schuster told me not to give the real name, but I call her out by a different name on what happened with this Jerry Maguire letter I wrote and why I made the decision that way and why I ended up starting uh, the companies that I started. That's number one. You tell me which one. That's the first one. The other one is my business principles, 10 of them that I'll share with you, things that I don't negotiate. The other one is uh, why I always talk behind people's back, the importance of it. The other one is uh, a, a, a excerpt in a chapter that says, I love you, but please sign the prenuptial agreement. That's another one. And the last one is uh, manage your ego and learn how to build alliances. Which one of those five do you want me to read to you first? Which excerpt? You tell me. You tell me which one you want me to read to you first. All right, let's see what we got here. 10 business principles, no problem. I'll read you the 10 business principles. First, let me go to that first. You guys are commenting a ton. Let me see what you said here. Uh, I got to get all the way to the bottom because the comments just went 10. Okay, I'll read the 10 first. I'll read the 10 first. Okay, so let's go to the 10 first. 
my business principles. Is that what it was? Ten of them, uh, the business principles. Okay. How you doing, by the way? Doing good? Well, you disappeared here out of nowhere. I love it. All right, so let's go to my, okay, page 120. Here we go with page 120. My business principles that I don't negotiate, okay? I do not negotiate. Okay. Here are uh, some of my business principles. Um, let me see. Blah, 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 blah. I go through this page. Okay, yeah. So, number one, never compromise my non negotiables. I don't compromise them. Once I'm set on an, and by the way, every time I've decided to compromise my non negotiables, I've failed and lost money. Number one is never compromise your non negotiables. Once you're clear about what things you're not willing to negotiate, never compromise it. Number two, micromanage until you trust. I micromanage new people until I trust them. Number three, what brought us here won't take us to the next level. A lot of people think just because you made a half a million dollars, you already have everything it takes to make a million dollars. To get to a million dollars, it's a different strategy than to get half a million dollars. If you made a million dollars, you want to make $10 million. $10 million is a lot different than $1 million. You made $10 million, you want to get your company to do to $100 million a year. It's a very different mindset. So what got you here will not take you to the next level. So every time I reach a new milestone, I have to ask myself, do you want to get to the next level and what's that strategy? Number four. No one has 100% job security, including me. Let me say this again. I say this in every meeting. No one has 100% job security, including the CEO. The way I get fired is by employees quitting, executives resigning, clients canceling, and investors leaving. That's how I get fired. Nobody has 100% job security. It's absolutely ludicrous and arrogant to think you have 100% job security. Next one. Create positive peer pressure by challenging one another. Every environment I've created, it's all about everybody challenging one another. Every environment. Because if it's always you having to do the work, you're always the bad guy. I don't want to just have to solve everybody's problems. You got issues with each other? Hash it out. Talk to one another. What's the problem? A guy screwed up something in the office? Why are you waiting on me to do it? You're not my six-year-old son. You're a 29-year-old grown man. Go tell him. I don't like what you did. That's not what we do in our office. Fair, bring it up. Always has been the case. Next, beat your prior best. Everything to us is about beating our prior best numbers. That's why it's all data. Every time you look at my desk over there, that's a mess. It's because there's data on my desk all the time. I got a call right after this at 10 o'clock in 30 minutes. And this call right after this, I do once a week every Tuesday. It's all about data and accountability. All of it right after this. Treat the company's money like it's your own. When I have somebody that I hire and I see how they handle company's money and they do it the right way, I look at that person and I say, that person can be a long-term decision maker for the company. Because if they're doing it as a regular employee, how do you think you're gonna handle that as an executive? But also if I see somebody that uses company's money, oh, don't worry about it, it's okay. Oh, it's okay, we're not gonna tell anybody, you'll take the money on this part. I know long-term, that is a form of stealing. Long-term, they're gonna cost me a lot of money as well. Just because we have tens of millions of dollars in the bank doesn't mean you have the ability to overpay for a product. I don't wanna overpay for a product, so everybody's gotta make sure they treat the company like it's throwing money. Radically open-minded, but not e easily persuaded. Very important because everybody in your family and your business are gonna have opinions on how you should run your company. Fight any temptation to lower expectations and standards. You'll be tempted to do it the more money you make. Create an environment where our team is taken care of financially and professionally. I want my team, my staff to be taken care of so they're not thinking about retirement, insurance, any of that stuff. So those are some of my business principles and then I go into a little bit more. So that's one of them. Now. How about I read you guys the excerpt of I love you, but please this, uh, uh, sign a prenuptial agreement. You guys okay if we go that side? Are you okay? Just say yes or no if you want me to read that. Yes? Okay, perfect. Let me go to this. Okay, like uh, 500 of you guys said yes. So let me go to that side. Page 132, we're going to go to getting your wife or your husband to sign a prenuptial agreement. What do you think about that, Adam? Uh, the prenuptial agreement, it's a pretty uh, exciting thing to do. Here's how the chapter starts. Ready? Chapter says, I love you, but please sign a prenuptial agreement. Let me read it to you. I've seen a lot of people get married. And at the start, everything was beautiful. You look at those couples and swear they'd love each other forever. You'd never guess that one day they would grow to hate each other and decide to get divorced. How many times have you seen that before? At that point, each person contacts an attorney. And what was once a bad situation becomes immeasurably worse. At least if you measure in terms of rage, stress, and dollars spent. Attorneys often pit husband and wife against each other, ratcheting up the tension in order to ratchet up their fees. That's how they make their money, by the way. If you're going through a divorce, tell your wife or your husband that. That's what they do. 
An acrimonious court fight means more money for them. By the end, the couple is drained both emotionally and financially. It doesn't have to be this way. Before you get married, you can say to your spouse to be, babe, I love you, but we don't know where we'll be five, 10, 15 years from now. Let's plan for the worst, but expect the best. That means we figure out right now what happens in a worst case scenario, divorce in terms of money, the kids and everything else. In other words, let's plan at least five moves ahead, right? After a few dates with Jennifer, the woman who I decided to get married to, we took a trip to a bookstore and I ended up buying her book, 100 more questions to ask. And then we talked about how many children do you want to have? I answered five. She said three. How many kids do you think we ended up with? I said five. She said three. Who do you think won? Honestly, who do you think won? We got three kids. You know why? Because she told me she does not want more, more than three kids. Fine. We ended up having three kids, which now feels like the perfect number. We made an agreement on that and other issues. And my wife compromised on some things and I on others. We talked about all the key material issues in advance and hammered out an agreement. Prenups are great for divorce settlements, but they are also valuable for marriages. By discussing key issues in advance, you can navigate the rocky moments that arise in every long-term relationship. Now watch how this goes, the next page. By the way, I'm not encouraging you guys to go and have a divorce right now with your wife or your husband. I'm just telling you, have a prenup or a postnup in place. Now, how does this apply to business? Some entrepreneurs say proudly, I don't need a contract. We have a handshake deal and my word is my bond. That's great, assuming that the other person is equally honest and forthright. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. The romantics may argue that by signing a contract, you're planning to fail. The realists see it as something every smart business owner understands, contingency planning. In business, you're going to have relationships with employees, partners, investors, suppliers, and advisors. You might love each other and every one of those people, but if you don't have a formal agreement, you're asking for the type of stress and financial loss that comes with the most contentious of divorces. When you hire someone, document everything, code of conduct, equity ownership, salary, vesting period, probationary period. If it's not documented, there will be no plan in place when uh, you do have a conflict. Before agreeing to any major business deals, you want to follow, you want the following to be agreed upon. You ready? Number one, liability cap. What's the most we can lose? Number two, indemnification. You can't sue me over dot, dot, dot. And number three, finite term. This isn't continuous. Once there is a term, we negotiate two years. Two years later, it's over. If I don't want to renew it again, we have to renegotiate a new deal. So many times you only negotiate and you think about money. I used to only negotiate with money until I realized it's more than just money. Right now, this morning, I have these two contracts to sign. You know what I told them? I'm not signing. Why? Because of one finite term that I'm not comfortable with. So this thing's not getting signed and it sat over here. This was supposed to be signed this morning at eight o'clock. I didn't sign it. It's sitting over here. I'm gonna have a call with them for them to change it. Because of one small little thing that we're talking about. So now watch this. Let's return to the marriage analogy. People get married emotionally and they divorce logically. More specifically, they fall in love and they think love will conquer all the problems simmering below the surface. They don't logically weigh the pros and cons of marrying someone. When they divorce, though there's obviously emotion involved, it's a more logical process. People argue about what they want, what they're willing to give up. Lawyers insist on putting a cognitive frame around emotional issues. It's all about numbers. How many weekends with your kids? How many this? How many that? Travel, miles, how much support will you provide? What is a logical division of property? All of that stuff. So if you have things in agreement up front, you don't have to worry about that. So this chapter, I spent a lot of times making sure you're protecting yourself long-term where you don't have to be naive and all of a sudden one day you wake up and you're like, holy moly, what I do, what I do here. Okay, you know, let me share with you Jer the Jerry Maguire side on page 43. Uh, I'll go to the Jerry Maguire side. Here we go. And by the way, there's about 15 to 20 pages of what I'm about to read to you that goes really into details. And uh, it is what it is, but I decided to write this in the book. Uh, because it's something everybody needs to be thinking about. When I was in my 20s, I was a big earner for an insurance company. My idea was to grow my wealth and eventually become the CEO of the company. I didn't think I had to quit to make a big impact and the fortune that goes with it. One day, I pulled a move straight out of the book, Jerry Maguire, and sent a 16-page letter to the higher-ups explaining my vision. Nobody responded. Then I sent it to the parent company, which was a $400 billion company, a company later on that ended up suing me. Within 30 minutes, a man named Jack responded setting up a meeting in Irvine, California. I told several of the executives my ideas and they try to implement some of them, but a woman named Katie, it's not her real name. She knows what her real name is, but her name's not Katie. Katie shut down the entire thing. In the opposite 
culture to Google's, the company made it clear that they didn't want me to innovate. Just as journalist Laura Ingram told LeBron James to shut up and dribble, that the company basically told me, shut up and just sell, right? Katie was a perfect example of an aristocrat and a bureaucrat. In the book, Barbarians to Bureaucrats, Corporate Life Cycle Strategist, Lawrence Miller describes how companies go through multiple stages, profit barbarian, builder, explorer, administrator, bureaucrat, and aristocrat. And once in a while, a synergist shows up to save the company from going out of business. At the time, there were many lawsuits against that insurance company, not to mention a reputation for unethical practices that damaged the brand. Because Katie was stubborn and unwilling to change, she ended up costing the company a few hundred million dollars. Hence, the business that got started. That's not a small number. She was arrogant, she was pompous, and she reminded me of Cersei Lannister in the Game of Thrones, the villain who thinks she's above everyone. What may have been worse is that the company tolerated Katie's behavior. This is very com uh, common when the original prophet leaves the company, the founder, and the existing builders and explorers give way too much power to one person who doesn't deserve it. Katie forced my hand, she cornered me. At the time, I didn't see my next move was investing all my savings into becoming an entrepreneur. Before making a decision, I scheduled a meeting with Katie, the executive team and their attorneys in Atlanta. There were several people in the room whom I respected tremendously. I went there to share my next five moves to see what they had to say. They didn't say much at the time. It was only later that the word got back to me that they thought it was all a ploy. They had assumed I was threatened to leave so they could give me cash to stick around. The attorney of the company <laughs> at the time was a man I really respected. He said to me, Patrick, this is very common in this industry. A major player like you comes and makes demands to get money or else leaves. The company isn't buying your bluff. Brilliant. The company isn't buying your bluff. I can tell you that no one at the table had a chance in hell on winning in a World Series of Poker. They read the situation completely wrong. I was 100% sincere. Rather than viewing my suggestions as an opportunity for growth, they went on the defensive and tried to justify the status quo by claiming that my intention was a way to shake them down. Keep in mind that by no means do I see myself as a victim in this story or things that were vengeful. vengeful. I simply think their corporate culture empowered a person who was driven by ego and self-image, Katie, rather than profitability and effectiveness. It was on me to make the next move. Very simple. At that point in my life, I had no desire to get sued, work hundreds of hours for 10 years, or deal with IT, HR, CRM, and dozens of acronyms that didn't yet un uh, I didn't yet understand. If Katie had known how to speak to lions, which we talked about in chapter eight, I would have stayed. But since she had, she did not know how to foster entrepreneurs, which we talked about tremendously in this book, I left. It's worth mentioning a second time that I didn't see myself as a victim in the story. By the way, I'm so glad Katie's one of the best things that ever happened. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. I have to tell you, I love you so much because of you, I have the life that I have right now. It's worth mentioning a second that I you know, don't see myself as a victim. Things are going to happen in business that are uh, some of you guys are laughing. <laughs> I apologize for laughing, but I actually don't apologize for laughing. This is a very good laugh. I enjoy this laugh. It's very natural. Things are going to happen in business that are beyond your control. How you choose to react to them will determine whether you become a master at your craft. Sometimes you are forced. It's very critical here, guys. Hear this one out. Don't get distracted. Just listen. Sometimes you are forced to make your next move sooner than you previously intended to. I was cl clear about my non-negotiables. And once they were compromised, I had to return to the chessboard of my career and devise a new plan of attack. Let me read it again to you. I was clear about my non-negotiables. Notice how we talked about the 10 non-negotiables first. I was clear about my non-negotiables. And once they were compromised, she compromised it. I had to return to the chessboard of my career and devise a new plan of attack. And I did. And by the way, I go into explaining a lot more of what happened there with that meeting in the book. And by the way, and yeah, in this, in the book, in the chapter that comes, let me see. You guys want me to read one more chapter or you want me to read one more excerpt or is that good? If you want me to read one more, say yes. If you want me to read one more and I'll go into it. Okay. Let's see if you guys want me to raise, uh, read one more. What do we have? Money over your ego, uh, talking behind people's back. So do you want me to do talking behind people's back? Or do you want me to do manage your ego and build alliances? I'll do one of them. Okay, just say behind people's back or ego. Behind people's back or ego. Uh, I think ego is winning. Oh, it's all ego. Okay, let's do ego. All right, so we'll go to page 212. We're going to do page 212. I love talking behind people's back. But you have to know why I love doing that. You're going to have to read the book to figure that part out. Okay, let me see if this is one. 
What is infused or making money? I'm like, okay, here we go. Let's talk about this. It's a good one. Manage your ego and build alliances. Nobody becomes a CEO of a large company who doesn't have a big ego. Nobody. There's nothing wrong with having a big ego as long as you have built the proper support system to keep it in check. If you can't control it, it will lead to your demise. When you become very successful and start making a lot of money and have fame and recognition, everyone will be looking for a way to get into your wallet and inner circle. As a result, you will be flooded with compliments. You'll be inundated with praise because you're surrounded by people who are afraid of the decisions you make. For instance, the members of your team may fear that you will fire them so they will tell you all the amazing things about you. Let me tell you, 90% of what they say are lies. 90% of what they say about the compliments to you are lies. Most people are not gonna tell you what you need to hear. You need a small circle of people around you who will tell you the truth. It's the only thing that will keep your ego in check. Though having three kids helps as well. If you don't have a small group of people such as a board of directors or mentors who aren't afraid of telling you off, you're going to be, you're going to be in trouble. I've seen this happen in sales, in sales many times. People start making money and everyone tells them how amazing they are. They're no longer coachable or willing to learn. They don't listen to advice. They sign, they, that's a sign that they have forgotten how to manage their ego. Staying paranoid also means staying humble. If you don't have humility, you can't bring people together. Without humility, people who disagree with you won't want to do business with you. How can you generate new ideas or invite fresh perspectives when you don't have diversity or dissenting voices in the room? When you have only people around you who agree with you, you'll naturally get complacent, which is the opposite of being paranoid. That's the ego part. And by the way, there's a lot of other things that's covered in this book. I can't wait to share this with you. But let me get right into the other things that we're doing uh, again, I wish the book was coming out today, but it's not coming out today. One thing you guys got to keep in mind about what Amazon told us to tell you, what Simon & Schuster told us to tell you. When you buy the book, the main link we're driving everybody to is Amazon, but some of you guys are international, other places. You may go to Simon & Schuster, and the Simon & Schuster link will also help you buy books from international places. Kindle's going to be available. The Audible's going to be available. I've already done the uh, audio recording. I was there recording. How many hours was I recording the audio, by the way? 20 hours I've already done. I got to go for last, I think, eight oh, more hours. Somewhere. I got one more day yeah. to go to finish up the uh, uh, audio with the book. So Audible will be available. Kindle will be available. And a book will be available for you to be able to purchase. But this is what Simon & Schuster told me on a conference call last week. So their biggest concern is the printers are not moving as fast as they normally were because of the essential side of being a business. They don't have all their workers in like they typically do. So why are we doing this three months before with the launch? One is, you know, it's a 12 week launch that we're doing. We decided on a 12 week. But the second thing was the sooner you purchase the book, the sooner they will already have your books in place to ship to you on August 18th. And you won't be one of those people. Well, day one, Amazon says sold out. You have to wait six weeks for a big to, book to be shipped out to you. You're locking in the fact that our books are coming out to you. And for some of you guys that have teams, uh, you have employees, you want your employees to also read it, or you want your, you know, a, a business partners to read it, your salespeople to read it. Maybe you're not just buying one copy, you're buying a couple copies. Well, then that's a different story as well. You may want to get a few copies for yourself. So that's that part about buying, a getting a copy of the book. Having said that, let me go wrap up this uh, 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 PowerPoint here uh, that I have. So pre-order incentives. A lot of people contacted, they said, Pat, can you do some pre-order incentives for the book? And uh, we said, no problem. We held a conference call with uh, Simon & Schuster last three weeks. We talked to them, our uh, agent, myself, Greg Dinkin, uh, who is uh, uh, my partner that I wrote this book with. You'll notice his name on the bottom. And we agreed on the approach that we're taking with the book. So here's what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. Anybody today, you buy one copy on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. You buy a copy of the book. You send an email to info at valuetainment.com. Let me say that one more time. You send an email to info at valuetainment.com, the receipt that you purchased it with your name, info at valuetainment.com, and the part that says it's been purchased. You send your name to info at valuetainment.com. We are going to send you, Mario, can you hand me that right yep. there? We are going to send you one chapter, okay? One chapter will be sent to you, and you'll have all these pages. It's like 20 pages or something. One chapter will be sent to you, for you to read, but you have to show proof of you having purchased one copy. You buy it, you send it to info at valuetainment.com. You'll have this email to you after you show proof that you bought it. Now, some of you may say, but Pat, I've already bought it. No problem, it's fine. If you bought it a week ago, two days ago, three days ago, you don't have to buy it right now. If you've already bought it, just send a receipt that you bought the book. 
We'll send you one chapter for you to read. And, uh, 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 and I want to hear your thoughts after you finish reading the chapter, because at the end it says, share your thoughts uh, and tweet me at Patrick Bay David. I actually want to hear exactly what you say after you read this. So if you haven't bought a chapter, if you haven't bought the book, buy a copy. Uh, once you get it, send us the link that you purchased the receipt. We're going to send you an advanced copy, uh, a, uh, a chapter of the book. Number two, if you buy three copies of the book, three copies, one for you, one for a friend, and one for somebody that works with you. If you buy three copies of the book, you'll get the chapter that'll be sent over to you. You'll get a one hour pre-recorded strategy session that I have just for the people that buy three. The one hour will be sent over to you. That's not going to everybody. It's not a public video. It's a private video. And it's only going to those that have bought three copies. And your name will go into a raffle. One name will go into a raffle for me to uh, uh, have you. You'll fly out, you'll pay everything. Your expense is gonna be on you. But you'll come here to a meeting just like we did when we passed uh, 100,000 subscribers yeah. or a quarter million subscribers. Jaron, who works with us right now, was one yeah. of the guys that showed up at 100,000 subscribers. Now he moved his entire family and uh, three kids from Minnesota to Dallas to work on a team. And we're very excited about him. So if you buy three copies, You'll get the one chapter sent over to you. You'll get the one hour uh, pre-recorded strategy session sent over to you. And your name will go into one raffle. The raffle, I'll pull out names and you'll be one of the ones. We're thinking about choosing 10 of them. We may be 10 or 15, maybe 20 people that will choose yeah. to come out. And you'll come here. It'll be yourself and a few other people. And we spend a half a day together. We'll go lunch. We'll be on me. We'll eat. We'll have a good time. You'll find your flight. You'll find a way to get here. And the rest uh, will be on us. But you'll get a tour of the home office. You'll see the culture. Uh, you'll see how it's set up. I'll put, take you to the studio. You come to my office. You'll get a chance to see the office here and we'll have, you'll see meet Mario. You'll meet our, you'll meet everybody when you come over here. So we'll have a good time together, but you got to buy three copies to be in that raffle. One name will go into the raffle. Next one, you buy 10 copies. Okay. You buy 10 copies. You'll get the free advanced chapter that we're sending to everybody. You'll get the one hour. You'll get the exclusive, uh, uh, the, the, the two hour strategy session, Mario, we have to skip that one because that one is replacing the live that we're doing. Okay. So the two hour strategy session is replacing, is being replaced by the live. Uh, uh, but you'll get the advanced copy, one hour pre recorded, uh, uh, the uh, raffle that you'll be chosen to come over here. Uh, and on top of that, this is what we're doing. So the only thing is that two hour strategy session is not going to be a part of it. So you buy 10 copies, you'll get free advanced chapter. You'll get one hour pre-recorded. You'll have three entries into being chosen to come over here. And the first 20 of you who buy the 10 copies and send us the receipt, we're going to send you a signed cover of the book mailed out to you. This is the first 20 that buy 10 copies. This is not a raffle. It's the first 20 that buy 10 copies of the book and you send the receipt to info at valuetainment.com. Then we'll... With, oh, by the way, I'm going to put your name. So you can tell me, can you put it to Joe? Can you put it to Bobby? Can you put it to Cindy? Mary, no problem. Let me know. I'll sign it with your name. And we're going to put this in a nice little, uh, what do you call those things you put in it? The poster uh, 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 oh, uh, canister. uh, uh, canisters, and I will then ship it over Here to you. Wait. But you have to buy 10 copies and send a receipt over to info at valuetainment.com. And we'll send that over to you. So again, let me do a quick recap with you. Number one, anybody that buys one copy, you're going to get the chapter sent over to you. Anybody that buys three copies, you'll get the chapter, a one hour pre-recorded strategy session, and your name will go into a raffle to fly out here and spend half a day with us. And you'll get a tour of the whole place. And anybody that buys 10 copies gets the free chapter, gets the one hour. You get three names in the raffle. And on top of that, uh, the first 20 that buy the 10 copies, we're going to send you a side uh, sleep uh, over to you. Uh, with a copy, uh, with signed sleeve of the book over to you. So remember, that's what's in place right now. And guys, I, I want you guys to be keeping in mind as you're buying the book. Uh, we have a lot of people that are international people here. For the folks that are in the States, you can buy it on Amazon and buy it on Barnes & Noble. I think right now it's not ranked number uh, run on entrepreneurship. Some tells me we have a shot at being number one on Amazon total today. And by the day it comes out, we want this thing to be sent out to tens of thousands of people worldwide for you to get the book in your hands specifically knowing the marketplace, everything's going to come down to you knowing your next five moves. And I can't wait to get a chance to spend the time, spend time with you guys, specifically for some of you guys that are kind of come over here. And then when the dust settles, we'll do some signings at different Barnes and Noble and places nationwide. And we got some real cool things that we're doing as we get closer to the book being launched. So again, thanks for joining us on this webinar. If you want the free chapter, order the book. 
If you want to be in the raffle and the one hour uh, pre-recorded strategy session, order three. And if you want to get a signed copy of the sleeve, order 10 and you'll have three names in a raffle. You'll get the pre-recorded and the chapter. Having said that, guys, last slide. what's the last slide? Your next five moves is what? They're going over there to do what? It's live. Oh, it's, okay, that's right. So you can now go to the website. And by the way, a lot of the forms that we're going to put up, a lot of the forms that we're going to put up for people to process, mm -hmm. all of them are going to be on yournextfivemoves.com. Yeah. Everything. So there's parts in the book that says, go to yournextfivemoves.com to get such and such worksheet. Go to yournextfivemoves.com. Everything's going to be in there. So if yeah. you haven't gone to the website yet, Go there. It's a very easy pre-order link that, uh, that'll take you to Amazon as well. Mario, any other things before I wrap up? Exciting time. I can't wait to get the book in your hands. Seriously, I can't even wait to get that one chapter in your hands to hear your thoughts. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. Love you. Stop All right, you there. do stop mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm.